My name is Sam Masucci. I am the CEO and founder of ETF Managers Group. Uh, we are a $4 billion ETF investment shop where we have 12 thematic ideas for investing in a number of different um, themes. That's everything from cybersecurity to mobile payments, uh, drone, commercial drone usage. Uh, and our most recent fund that we launched and has been a, uh, I would have to say, an immediate success out of the gate is the ETFMG Alternative Harvest ETF. It is an ETF that focuses on the medicinal side of global cannabis companies. We launched the fund at $7 million at the end of 2017. The fund now has $1.3 billion under management, um, several hundred thousand investors, and it actually has returned close to 40% this year. So it's been a, uh, a, uh, certainly a broad success across the U.S. investor base, and we spend a lot of time helping to educate people, not just on the fund, but more importantly on what's going on in the industry and why it's important to look at it as an investment product, and that's why we're having this panel today. So we have, I think, a very interesting group of people, um, all come from very different backgrounds, but all with very, very knowledgeable in the cannabis space. Um, let me grab my glasses here. First, we have Ron Geffner. He's the founding member of Sadis and Goldberg, a leading authority on fund formation. I think what's also interesting when I met Ron is that uh, he spent a number of years at the SEC as an enforcement attorney. And as I said to Ron, it's happy, I'm happy that I didn't meet you before this panel. Um, and I think Ron brings an interesting perspective as people like to think about not only what are the opportunities in cannabis, but um, from a regulatory standpoint, um, what, what's happening there. Um, we then have Trent Overholt. Trent is the CEO of 14th Round, which is a California design and technology company. Trent's doing a lot of work on the engineering and manufacturing of um, the, the instruments used for vaping and is a leader within that space within, um, within cannabis. And then lastly, we have Grover Norquist. Um, for those who do not know, he's president of the American Tax Reform. Um, he was uh, put in that place or asked to form American Tax Reform by Ronald Reagan. And um, again, very, very tied into what's going on in Congress, what the progress of what I'll call federal and state clarity is now in this space. So we've, we have a number of topics that I think will be interesting, and the first one we'd like to start with is, is it safe to invest in cannabis? Um, I think it would also help to have a little brief, just an uh, outline of what does it mean, what is the cannabis industry? Because uh, many people think of cannabis as, uh, whether it's Cheech and Chong, Reefer Madness, and are really not in tune yet to the benefits uh, that are being done both medicinally and, and um, uh, with CBD oil, with, with cannabis. So with that, I'd like to start with uh, Ron. A little brief overview of what it means, cannabis, the broadness of the space, and then sure. its safeness or not. Okay. So for background purposes, in 1970, a body of law called the Controlled Substances Act was enacted. Making, it was, marijuana was listed as a Schedule I drug making it illegal to cultivate or sell marijuana in the United States. Fast forward 30, I guess 42 years in 2012, Washington State and Colorado become the first two states to legalize cannabis in a recreational form. At this point in time, if you're creating a business in a state where it was legal, while you're complying with state laws, you were violating federal laws and violating the Controlled Substances Act. So obviously there's a conflict between state and federal law. Attorney General um, Cole adopted a memo where he instructed the U.S. attorneys and Department of Justice due to limitation of resources not to prosecute violations of the Controlled Substances Act in the states where people are complying with the state law. Trump administration comes into play. The Cole memo gets rescinded by uh, Attorney General Sessions saying it's fair game and then, most recently, the Attorney General Barr went back and reinforced the Cole memo. So you still have this, while you have the government not enforcing violations of the Controlled Substances Act, you still have an inherent violation of law going on with the federal government. Since then, we have had 47 states, one way or another, adopt laws governing medicinal recreational use of cannabis. 
the majority of Americans, based on polls, support the legalization of cannabis. And now there are several bodies of law that are being proposed to remediate the problem of this inconsistency between federal and state laws. The two most leading statutes, one is referred to, and these are the acronyms for, thank goodness, one is called State Act, and one is called the SAFE Act. And the State Act basically makes reference to the Tenth Amendment, in which if Congress did not explicitly outline laws, it's left to the states to mandate those laws. And if it were to be enacted, it would reinforce and codify basically the Cole Memo and fundamentally create an exemption under federal law, allowing the state's rules to apply without risk of federal prosecution. Conversely, the SAFE Act is designed to create a safe harbor for both banks and insurance companies to provide services to uh, organizations or persons complying with the state laws in which they conduct themselves. And embedded with the enforcement component and the adoption of laws, you have to appreciate there's different constituencies looking to these laws for different reasons. There's criminal justice, there's um, social measures that are, are being embedded in some of the laws and not others. And so there's a, a tug and pull. And then the question will be, which is, if you ask most people, is it going to be federally legal? Almost everybody says yes. What people cannot agree upon is when, when. and how. And the how, in the big part, is, which is subsumed to what we're talking about today, is a tug and pull whether it's going to be regulated by states or the federal government. And the argument for states is that they understand the social issues of their local uh, municipalities, cities, and towns far better than the federal government. And standards in New York may not be the standards in California. Thank you. So Trent, your business is an interesting one in that um, you're producing products that aren't directly impacted, but clearly are uh, tangentially impacted by changes in state and federal law as well as global and social acceptance. How do you view what is going on with the lack of clarity within regulation now and uh, how it may impact the way you're building your business? The regs are consistently improving and we all celebrate that progress as an industry, it's just a very difficult environment for them to operate in. Logistical challenges of not being able to cross state lines, there's no efficiencies um, that a normal CPG or consumable product manufacturer would benefit from. And we see all of that. We're a, we're a no-touch ancillary business. Um, picks and shovels is commonly used to describe uh, a business like ours. And we focus on the top brands, that's where, we're, that's where we're placing our bets. So we see the challenges of the biggest and best operators, and even they are struggling to, to operate with this patchwork of regulations. Uh, each individual state has a notably different set of regs, so how, how one of our brands operates in California is notably different than what they can and can't do from uh, the product, the consumable itself, so the cannabinoid count, the material composition of the product itself, but also the packaging, the regulations, and the regs changed. Uh, packaging regs changed twice in California in 2018. It was massively disruptive. So, in spite of all that, the industry is growing and it's exciting, and there's a lot of us that are glad to be in, to be in early. It's dramatically dragging down the potential. Um, and obviously, there's some things as it relates to banking that are just, you know, they're, they're clunky, they're unsafe. There's a lot of cash distribution because it's, you know, for a lot of these businesses, the, the consumer income is all in cash. And they have to turn around and use that because they have the same banking challenges. But you, you talk about timing of investment and despite all these inconsistencies of the regulations that the industry has grown. This, the cannabis industry, if you look at it comparative to other major industries, is following a very common model. It went from a growth to an explosive growth, yep. and now we're seeing vertical integration, consolidation within the industry, and then the next step would probably be hyper-specialization, which is what Trent in part is talking about with regard to branding yep. of products, that there aren't really many consistent brands and products if you went to dispensaries, and uh, that's probably the next stage. But also, this inconsistency of regulation, while it's a hindrance in certain ways, for the people who are savvy investors, and I've been investing in the cannabis space personally for over six years, the inconsistency is where you develop alpha from, in the sense that you have to roll up your sleeves. And what we read on the internet is partially accurate. There's a lot of misinformation in the marketplace. 
And so then you're doing channel checking, reaching out to all the different industry verticals that you know yep. to confirm the information, to vet the quality of the people you're doing business with. And the benefit for me with wearing my legal hat, the law plays in such an important variable role in connection with investing in this industry. Well, and that's, I think, a great transition to Grover because you live in the, I'll call it the DC political machine. You see what's going on. You're hearing the rumblings on both sides of the aisle. So I think everybody would be very interested to see from your vantage point, not only what's happening, what's first, what's second, how does this migrate into more clarity, but what does it even look like? Is it, is it not rack, it's only medicinal, or how do you view the world? It, the move to end prohibition for cannabis uh, is following a path that a lot of other issues have taken. Uh, you can't do it in Washington, D.C. There was gridlock as long as we tried to do everything at once in D.C. The answer was there's always something else. Uh, each party had other things at stake and nobody was going to take a risk uh, and move on it. So just nothing moved. But then as states start to do it, it's how criminal justice reform, which was passed nationally just a couple of months ago, first passed in Texas and then people waited to see if there was lots of crime in Texas, and there wasn't. And then Alabama and other states started passing it. You got enough states, and then Washington did it. Term limits went state by state, and then to committee chairs. Uh, the right to try movement went state by state, 41 states, and then Washington. Uh, I think it's gonna take more than 41 states to end prohibition in the states before we get a national law. Uh, and, but what it has done is it said state by state. Now the two things that kill uh, the growth of the cannabis industry are the difficulty or impossibility of safely legally banking because of federal law. Um, cause it's still illegal to sell, own, use cannabis uh, under the federal law. And the other one is that federal law, uh, federal tax law, says that for anybody else, if you're a bank robber for a living and they arrest you, and they say, well, how much did you get from the bank? And you tell them, and then you say, well, how much did you pay your henchmen and pay for gasoline? You deduct those, and then you're taxed on your earnings. And, and all criminal activity, you can be taxed on your ill-gotten earnings. Uh, but it's on the profits. For all Schedule One drugs, marijuana included, the 35, now 21% corporate rate does not apply to your uh, profits. It applies to your sales. It's a sales tax because you're not allowed to get necessary and ordinary business expenses deducted. They changed this in 1982 when the New York Times and everybody else was outraged that somebody was getting these deductions and so we banned it for everybody. Um, so right now we've got 21% sales tax in effect on cannabis sales. And the States Act, which was mentioned, uh, will both allow you to take necessary and ordinary business deductions like you were a, any other store or business uh, in any state where cannabis is legal. Uh, and it will also allow banking um, in any state where cannabis is legal. It gets rid of those two huge stoppers. Uh, the good news is this bill will pass. Uh, I thought it was gonna pass last uh, fall. Uh, President Trump uh, expressed his support for it publicly. And then Schumer came right out after him and said, I'm for national. Uh, uh, prohibition, and when the two parties are both moving to be in front of the movement towards greater end of prohibition, that's a healthy place to be. Uh, uh, Cory Gardner, who's taken the lead role along with Elizabeth Warren on the States Act, uh, I just spoke with him yesterday to make sure I was speaking correctly. He says the president, just like a few weeks ago, reiterated to him his support for signing this bill, uh, his support for not enforcing these laws right now in states like Colorado, uh, and uh, that the Republican leadership uh, is also supportive of the bill and it should be able to pass. Our danger now is that some people look at a bill that has bipartisan support. You think it'd be a piece of legislation. You think it'd be called enacted legislation. Actually, everybody in Congress views it as something to attach boat anchors to. If this is gonna pass, I have a stupid idea, but I could sell my vote if you attach my little project to your successful, beloved, everybody agrees on project. If you put enough of these boat anchors on anything, it doesn't sink, it doesn't float anymore, it sinks. So if we can keep that from happening, and the Senate can keep it clear, because Mitch McConnell 
hemp, 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 is actually very supportive of getting this done. He also thinks it's very helpful for Cory Gardner in his Senate race. So the Senate is going to do this. The Senate has rules that can stop annoying uh, amendments that clog it up. The House, you probably see people at least showboating about attaching other things uh, to it. But this bill, this should pass this year, and it solves both the banking and the tax problem at the national level. Another discussion is all the damage states are doing when the 700-page piece of legislation in New York to legalize cannabis spent one page legalizing it and 699 criminalizing things near it uh, or at central to it. So we're getting some very bad state end of prohibition, new sets of regulations that will slow stuff down. Okay. So, Ron, so, I think you'd like to follow. Yeah, so there's two points there. One of the, if you read articles in the media on the subject between state law and federal law, there's an argument that their laboratories of democracy by allowing all the states to play with their own rules, eventually you're going to see maybe a better idea, a better set of rules and regulations that will come and then other states will mimic it. Sort of like what we've seen with Delaware law from a corporate perspective, and you have Cayman law mimicking Delaware law and other countries mimicking and other states mimicking the state statutes. Sure. Another component which the, any of these uh, bodies of law will have an effect on is the current lay of the land effectively castrates institutional and non-US money for the most part coming into the cannabis sector. Yep. So how you have these private businesses raising money, that will change as well. And what, and what do I mean by that? In certain countries, if it's federally illegal to invest here, it would be a violation of their local laws. And so you're, there is a challenge as we create funds, where to domicile those funds in a suitable jurisdiction to allow those non-US persons or US tax exempt investors to come in. The other effect is even if it becomes federally legal, there are some jurisdictions where even if it were legal here, it's a violation of their local laws to invest in US cannabis-based businesses. Okay. And interestingly, in spite of all that, there's some semblance of a strategy, good operating team will not have trouble getting funded. But the money's coming from high net worth persons and right. family offices predominantly. That's right. That's right. And I'm sure we could spend another couple hours speaking about regulation, but I'd like to move it on. Um, so one of the benefits of being an ETF issuer is the stocks that we hold in our portfolio. In the case of MJ, uh, it, those, that portfolio is put in place to replicate a heavily researched index. And that index is made up of global opportunities within companies that meet minimum criteria. Can't, be, uh, can't violate any US federal or state laws. Need to have minimum capitalization values. Need to have minimum liquidity. And they need to be uh, primarily a component of the theme, which in the case of MJ is um, uh, medicinal marijuana. Um, what that does for individuals uh, and institutional investors is they don't have to look and find through their own research where the best growth opportunities are in individual stocks. They're not taking single stock risk. But since many, many investors are investing across the globe, a, a question that comes up all the time is, what are the opportunities in each of the countries as you see acceptance uh, uh, growing, as you see more regulation clarity? Obviously, Canada is the, the poster child for that. Um, I was in Rome with my family last, uh, last summer, and I walked past a place that had uh, 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 cannabis. They were, they were in Italian. They said, well, we have cannabis-infused gin at this bar. Um, so clearly, uh, the Italians were uh, a little more widely accepting it. So when you think about other countries, which is both regulatory uh, clarity as well as investment opportunity, outside the US, outside of Canada, w do you guys have a view on that? Yeah, it's becoming more increasingly popular. We're seeing more global acceptance. You, you read more transactions every day, and they just seem to be coming on faster and faster pace. People around the globe seem to be looking now for investable areas, having a look at laws and the tax effect on their investments. So we're, we're seeing it being more, um, more adopted and the mindsets really change, especially from like six years ago. Six years ago, we'd get calls from investors, family offices, that were investing in ancillary-related businesses, like real estate that might have been subletting or renting space to somebody either indirectly or directly tied to the plant. And they had this fear and this vision in their head there. They were going to be uh, abruptly woken up in the middle of the night with 
you know, people with masks on their faces, barricading their doors and breaking it down and grabbing their infants from their beds right. and seizing all their possessions. We don't get those calls that often anymore. So I would say it seems to be, in the investor community, even on the deals we invest in, we're seeing people from around the world on the cap table. Okay, Trent, I know you're doing a, a number of things internationally. How do you view it? I think, it, going back to the, the regulatory patchwork and a little compare and contrast, Canada and cannabis come up like carrots and peas, right? It's the same sentence, same paragraph for sure. It's interesting though, and maybe not known in the room, so far to date, the only thing available for sale in this wonderful federally legal market is flour. And as Bruce put it this morning, it's, it's, it's an ingredient. It is not a ready for consumption product. So specific international market, Canada, our neighbor to the north, that's really exciting because in markets like California, where we have 30 million adults and a lot of brands are born, um, flour as a percentage of market share is declining and ready to consume products are dramatically outperforming. So it was scheduled for October 17th, I don't know if it's still gonna happen, 2019. Concentrates, infused products, vaporizers, the fastest growing categories within this high growth industry now come online in Canada. And I think that's, for us, that's one that we're focused on. It's a large market, there's 38 million people. So I think that's the most interesting one is these regs continue to open up. Grover, I, I, from, from the way that you, know, you view and, and in Washington, how important is it for, while decisions are being made in DC, for them to look at the adoption of other countries and the way they're treating it? Is it important or are we the US we dictate the way the rules are in our country, and this is how we do it. it you know, it's helped. I mean, Switzerland sort of decriminalized heroin, but nobody spends a lot of time saying, let's, let's do that. I don't know that the U.S. looks at other countries so much. The success is that we have some states, and Colorado is not Alabama, and it's not Alaska. It's not some outlier. It's sort of in the middle, and you think of it as... Uh, something like your state, uh, so that Colorado was a first mover, just as when Texas was a first mover on criminal justice reform, people said, well, they're not weak on crime, this must be okay, and Colorado's not, uh, I don't know, Vermont or something, and so you, it, it, it makes it easier to say if it works in Colorado, it may work in, in my state. I think it's, we will, other states will learn from the states that have had success. The crises that people projected have not apparently happened, or at least they're not measurable. Uh, I do worry that regulations can create the problems. They started with a 15% tax in Colorado and then went to 25. Yeah. Uh, that makes it easier for the black market, the free market in cannabis to continue, and some of the, the advantages of having a legal, non-prohibited product, such as tax revenue that come in and and, and safety in the product and, uh, and people knowing what's there uh, is lost. Uh, California, in order, to, in order to pass these things, just like when we got rid of alcohol prohibition, we made a deal with the devil and that was, okay, we're not gonna have federal prohibition but the 50 states can do any stupid thing they want to beer, wine, spirits. And they can run state liquor stores like Bulgaria 1953, and a number of them still do, uh, or they can have the three-tiered system where the wholesalers steal all the money. Uh, and there are a lot of people who wanted cannabis to be deregulated, to be legalized, who said, do, do to us what, what you did with liquor. That was great. It, no, it wasn't. That is not what you want to be. You want to be like asparagus, not like alcohol. Um, you want to be regulated like asparagus. And too many compromises have been done. In California, they bought us, bought every enemy of the end of prohibition, cops, prison guards, paid them all off with the taxes from cannabis and bought the votes or bought off the opposition to it. Uh, they dealt in the wholesalers in the state when they were doing it. Uh, so we're ending up with some very bad deregulatory laws that are much less deregulatory. We almost passed a complete legalization in North Dakota, which was one page. You, you can do it. It, it. Not the 600 pages that follow telling you you can't. And the popularity of it can be seen from a politician's standpoint. Oklahoma had an election to allow uh, medicinal mar marijuana and 
uh, a governor's race that was not without interest, two very serious candidates. 40,000 people in Oklahoma went to the ballot, voted to, uh, on the cannabis issue, and not for the rest of the ballot. Uh, not for governor, not for nobody. And that says to both Republicans and Democrats, there are votes in those hills. And politicians watch vote-moving issues. And it's clear that the people against prohibition are, are it moves their vote, lose the vote of individuals. They're, we're not seeing individuals say, I don't care what else, but if you're for legalizing marijuana, I'm a guinea. That's not showing up in the polls, and that's why Republicans and Democrats nationally and increasingly state by state are seeing this as non-contentious. But this is a huge swing. Two years ago, we had an attorney general who was going to knock down people's doors and arrest them in the right. middle of the night. Uh, so we're, we are not that far from that. Uh, I think we're moving away from it fast enough that we'll, we are safe, but we move very quickly, and the issue has moved very quickly in a short period of time. Okay. But, but, if, you, but if you look at regulation and compare it to other industries, it's, it's dynamic, it will continue to change and evolve. There'll be some bad things that occur in some states where somebody may die or commit suicide tied to some connectivity to cannabis that will have an effect on that market. But if you look back to the liquor industry, because you referenced it, in the latter half of the 19th century, early 1900s, there were 614 distillers of whiskey, I believe. Three bodies of law came into effect. In a 10-year period, the number of distillers that existed from 613 became 34. Post-prohibition, even greater consolidation. So it's, what are the lessons we've learned from that? And then look about, talk about taxes. Yep. Try to remember the stadium where they lowered the prices of the foods and that they had the, the result in increased sales, greater number of sales than they've ever had. So some states may realize our taxes are too high and we will make more tax revenue if we, we play with the levers a little bit more and fine tune it. And also if we get past this notion that cannabis is a horrible um, plant. I mean, we, we really haven't even the touched stigma. the surface. Yeah. The, stigma's, the stigma's still strong. Right. I, I was very stigmatized up until five, six years ago. Sure. I, uh, so that's evolving as well, and that's affecting the lawmakers, and it's affecting the consumers of the product, and as information becomes more shared. And, and some of these bills that are being proposed uh, um, include revenue that's going to be going to General Accountability Office to track the fatalities and other negative um, fallout that might come from legalization. So all this stuff still is evolving as we better understand it. So Trent, one of the things that I found fascinated when we, fascinating when we started researching MJ, the components that would go into it, was the, 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 the breadth of the opportunity. Um, it's, you know, it's not combustibles only, it's, it's vaping, it's, it's sure. um, CBD, hemp oil. Um, you know, I, we were with Bruce Linton this morning and he's talking about a deal that he put together with uh, Martha Stewart and Snoop Dogg and they're developing literally um, um, pet-based CBD products for pet ailments. So when you look at our fund, we have, sure, we have, you know, we have the, the Tilrays, the Canopies, the Auroras. We have um, Scott's miracle Grow because of their investment, and that's yep. an ancillary uh, yep. beneficiary. We have Japan Tobacco. They know how to deal, you know, they know how to obviously process leaves and things like that. And a lot of the tobacco companies are now uh, consolidating uh, the vaping opportunity. So as a businessman and someone in this space, how, how do you look at kind of where what I'll call the pick, as you said before, the picks and the shovel opportunities are. It, yeah, there's, it's all connected, it's all connected to the regs and it fundamentally just boils down to accessibility, right? The legal framework makes it more interesting for more businesses to invest and make products accessible. Better product building companies, CPG style companies come in and create products that are more accessible. A lot, of, a lot of consumers don't want to smoke anything. They don't want to smoke cigarettes. They don't want to smoke any form of cannabis. And so building out these products that are better aligned with the segments they were intended for. And, you know, it's just your classic P&G, CPG playbook, right? It gives them a, it's a, play, it's a, it's a field of play for them to go execute something that they know will work with consumers. 
now that the industry is maturing and that accessibility, whether legal, consumer, the stigma is an item of accessibility. If it feels grimy, some people won't even try. If it feels like something I heard about that helped a friend of mine's pet with its anxiety, well, that's not scary at all. Right. And even the whole marijuana cannabis thing was, was literally designed to drive that stigma. Exactly. Marijuana is a small subset of the broader umbre umbrella of cannabis, and a lot of these products have zero intoxicating effect. Right. So, again, there's, there's, a, there's a plurality to it that's not easy to thumbnail, but it's worth understanding because within it there's, for this room, a ton of investment opportunity, right? You've got the five primary license types for your legal channels, for your pure plays. You could be a cultivator grower, processor manufacturer would be the second one, distributor, retailer, and then the, usually there's a test lab that does it because all of these products in the regulated market are spankety clean. Right. Pesticides, fungicides, it's all cannabis in the legal channel is way cleaner than that piece of fresh produce you got at Whole Foods. So it's just held to a higher standard because of this, because of the stigma, because of its past. Sure, and so a lot so, of it is validating absolutely. the industry, validating the investment opportunities, and certainly giving an awful lot of uh, both direct and ancillary uh, investment bets, as well as uh, a fund like ours. I see that we have hit a hard stop. Uh, I'd like to thank our panelists, uh, Ron, Trent, and Grover. I thank you very much. You've done a great job. You've brought an interesting, interesting perspective uh, to investing in cannabis. And I'm assuming that you, afterwards you would be available for any questions that someone from the audience Definitely. might have. Certainly. All right. Well, thank you very much, everyone. Right. Thanks, Sam. Thank you.